book of Daniel. We're we'll looking at chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. My headings was Daniel's terrifying vision. It says in verse 2 and 3, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. In Daniel 1, verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Over the last few years, there has been a lot of talk concerning the Daniel fast. A lot of churches, first of the year, engaged in the 21-day Daniel fast. There are people who, for health reasons, engage in Daniel fast to lose weight, to turn on their spirituality. I, I, I don't know all the reasons, but they, 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 they look to Daniel fast as a means of being able to achieve some sense of direction spiritually. And it was suggested to me that New Seats and Ministry have a fast. Now you have to understand who I am. I'm not one who does things just because. And, and matter of fact, I'll be very honest with you, my own fasting over my entire ministry has been when God has specifically told me to fast. I don't jump on any bandwagon. This year, there was something different. And I, I felt an inclination not the first of the year, but that we would look at doing it during the period of not Lent, as Lent already started, but right leading up to the Resurrection Sunday. And so uh, I prayed about it and I felt God was moving us in that direction. So I said, okay, now I've got to understand because if you read in Daniel 1 8, you'll find out that Daniel. Challenge the, the overseer to let them eat just vegetables and drink water for 10 days. And I, I tried to figure out, okay, well, I, I know about that, but where does the 21 day fast come in? So I had to do some research because it's easy to get caught up with the crowd. And, and do things that you hear because you believe you're doing right. And so I was reading in the 10th chapter of Daniel, and Daniel says in verse 1, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. That thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understood the vision. Then Daniel says, In those days, I then was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So I took this and I took the two of them and I tried to make sense of this thing called a Daniel fast. And I began to study this book of Daniel. And this is a very powerful book. If you've not read it, you need to really spend some time with it. But, but I, I began to see something about Daniel. And for all that Daniel is, in terms of prophetic, in, in terms of Old Testament knowledge, I was riveted to the 12th chapter and the second verse. In the 12th chapter, the second verse, I have a heading that says, the time of the end. I don't know what yours says, but mine says, the time of the end. But that's not what 
God on high. What caught my eye is that Daniel's life was lived as an example. That's what Paul said. That's what Jesus said. It was an example that we should learn from them. And right in the second verse of that 12th chapter I read, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. What Daniel was saying, and I think this is a key verse for all that before and after pivoting on this one statement here, Daniel saying that there is a day of reckoning. And, and, and when I look at the true purpose of Daniel's life, it's more than a 10-day eating trial. It's more than three weeks without food. It's more than the vision of the handwriting on the wall. What Daniel was saying, because he told King, he told the king, he said, your life has been found hanging in the balance. And so I began to understand that what Daniel was saying is that there's a day of reckoning for all of us and Daniel's life has a purpose that says that what God is calling all of us to is a radical way of living. And why do you say that? Because in the book of Daniel, my friends, no matter what's going on that's external to Daniel's circumstances, Daniel wants us to know that God moves and participates in the immediacy of human life. God intersects, God intervenes, God shows up, God delivers, God sanctifies, God keeps his people in the middle of them living in their day-to-day -day existence. That's what Daniel wants us to know. And he wants us to know that, yes, there are many encounters in Daniel that stir us, but what Daniel wants us to know is that everything that happens to us is not history in the traditional sense, but it's his story. How God moves and how God empowers and how God delivers and how God sanctifies. And so, I say to you that no matter how dark the night, no matter how desperate the situation, no matter how spiritually dead you think you are, your personal resurrection is the basis of your individual hope and understanding within your present and your future history, would you say? I said that every situation you have, every circumstance that you're involved in, one of two things can happen. You can either have a personal resurrection or you can die in the circumstance. It's up to you how you deal with that situation because no matter how damaging it might seem, you have the ability to be resurrected out of your dead life situations and your dead life circumstances. That, 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 that's what Daniel's about. That there's no situation, no circumstance. Your present and your future, because if you allow situations to kill you, to damage you, you will always be looking back from the future saying, it's always been this way. Daniel you want you to know that that's not your life story. That's not your life journey. When you've been resurrected out of the situation, then you can say, because the Lord was on my side, because he heard my cry, because he delivered me, I know that this circumstance cannot overtake me. Yeah. Now, Daniel himself was born of Jewish nobility. Read the first chapter of Daniel. He was born of Turn the record. This is in the third reign, here the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, who never connected the king of Babylon to Jerusalem, and he besieged her. No, he came down and took him. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land, and Shinar to the house of his God. He brought the vessels into the treasure house of gold. 
And the king spoke to F.S. and, and Matthew the Phoenix, and he said that he should be concerned the children of Israel and of the who the king's seed and to Daniel was born of royalty. And he was brought to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had a plan. Nebuchadnezzar, in his captivity, he said he wanted children with, with no blemish but fair, uh, with well favored and skilled in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding and science and has such an ability in understanding the, the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldean. And so in other words, he said, I got a plan for these folk. But these got to be the best, they got to be the brightest. And they need to be of royal lineage. And I got a plan for them. He says, I want to be able to change who they are and give them a new way of dealing with life. You who are of noble birth, you who are godly birth, the world has a plan for you and it wants to empower you to speak a new language, not a godly language. Why the enemies after our best, our brightest, our smartest. He wants them. And if he can keep them out of God's nurturing and God's growing up, then he can pervert them. That's why when they got there, they got new names. They were given new names. You, you, you call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, verse 6, now among them were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the priests of the eunuchs gave names, but gave unto Daniel the name of the Shatzar, to Hananiah and Shadrach. He gave them those names. Why? He wanted to change their nature. That's why you always have to be careful who you hang out with. The folk are quick to call you out of your name. Why? Because if they can call you out of your name, they can change your nature. If they can change your nature, they can change your destiny. That's why we have to teach our children not to pay attention. See, they never said they can stick some stones, maybe break my bones, but that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Name hurt. Names will have folk do things that they wouldn't. You are dumb. You're stupid. You're scared. You're afraid. You're chicken. All these things are designed to pull us out of who we really are and to change us so that we go along with the crowd. But once you know your name, saved. Once you know your name, sanctified. Once you know your name, delivered. Once you know your name, victor. Then you don't fall prey to that pulling down when you recognize that it's God who pulls you up. So I like the story because when we read the story, Hananiah, Ezekiah, Mishael, we, we, we even we, we we change the names. We talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we don't change Daniel's name. And, and that's interesting because you see, here's the thing: Daniel's name, Daniel means God is my judge. And his name, Babylonian name, it means, ready for this, it means may God, small g, protect his life. The other three names were named after Babylonian God, but Daniel's name said may God protect us. Now, there's irony here because they weren't talking about Jehovah God, but there's something about Daniel whose name stays consistent throughout the word of God, and there's something about how we see Daniel who stays consistent throughout the journey that we ought to see not only in Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but we ought to see in ourselves. Because one thing about it is that I, I, for years and years, I've been doing it. I've done it here before. When I ask folks, how many of you are saved, sanctified, for all those who feel Christian? Hands go up. Boom. How many of you are sinners? Same hands go up. Boom. I'm trying to figure out how can you be both? If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. Say new creation. New creation. All things have passed away. Say the old has passed away. Oh, so I can't be duplicitous. 
implicit or schizophrenic in my spiritual understanding of who God has made me. The Bible says that he has made us royal priests. He calls us a holy nation. God says good things about us, and yet we say bad things about ourselves. See, I used to be a sinner. But now I'm sanctified. I've been set apart for a holy reason because I've been set apart for a holy reason. I don't have to take ownership on what I used to be when God is conforming me into what he needs me to be. See, that's the story of Daniel because Daniel recognized who God created him to be. Are y'all with me? Yes. All right, so Daniel born of Jewish nobility and favored in Babylonian captivity. Knew that every dead situation, every thou straight, every demonic standing, every device of spirit, and every doubtful shift pale when God interrupts human history. That's why Daniel was known as a praying man. Because he recognized that God was always available. Now, Daniel speaks to us and teaches us this fact that in the midst of chaos and human conflict God endures forever. Let me say it again. That in the midst of human chaos and conflict God endures forever and his kingdom cannot be destroyed. My friends, like Daniel, we must understand that God is sovereign and omnipotent, and his will permeates and supersedes every aspect of your life. God's will takes precedence over everything and everyone. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 1830, listen to the words, it says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Psalm 1830. So what is Daniel's purpose? I'll give you three points and I'll be out of here. I don't want to keep you long. Dan Daniel's purpose. What is Daniel's purpose? That's the name of the sermon. Can I fit the script and give you the third point first? Is that okay? So you normally it's one, two, three in sequential order, but I need to give you the third one first because even though it progresses to the third point, it's the most important point. So you can put number three. I got number three, one, two, okay? So I'm going to give you the third point first for Daniel's purpose. Daniel's purpose, and it's living, and I haven't got to the part about the fast yet, okay, is this. Number three, if you wait for the lion's den to pray, it's already too late. That, that's number three. If you wait for the lion's den to pray, it's already too late. What's the point? What's the point? What's the point three? Let's go to Daniel 6. Daniel 6 is Daniel. That's Daniel in the lion's den. That's what one through ten is about. I'm not going to read it to you. Don't read it to you. But we find Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was approximately 85 years old at this time. Okay? Now, one thing I found out about people, one thing I found out about prayer is this that most serious prayer is what I call crisis bargaining prayer. Most serious prayer is what I call crisis bargaining prayer. And in the midst of our situation, in the midst of our circumstance, we try to leverage God. Crisis bargaining prayer. We try to leverage God. God, if you do this, I'll do that. We try to bargain. Lord, if you save my marriage, I'll serve you. Lord, if you deliver me from the sickness, I'll go to church. Lord, if you do this, I'll read my Bible. Lord, if you do this, I'll start time. Who are we to bargain with God? Who are we to leverage God? 
There's not a thing that you have that God needs. The fact of the matter is, when you get sick and you say, if you heal me, I'll read my word. You should have been reading your word in the first place. You might not have been sick. And so Daniel wants you to know that before you get to your lion den situation, you ought to have been praying from the get-go. If you wait then, it's too late. How was Daniel able to go to the lion's den and not be concerned about the lion? Because Daniel had been a praying man all his life. And he knew one or two things, that God was going to show up, or God didn't show up, he knew he was going to go up. Either situation and circumstance, I'm a winner. He went in without any trepidation. Why? Because he knew God knew how to answer his prayer. But y'all not, you're not feeling this. See, Daniel, that's, how old did I tell you he was? About 85. He was an old man, same old man. But he was a godly old man. He knew God and God knew him. And, and here's the thing I like about it. Daniel knew something about connecting with the word. Turn to Daniel 9. Turn to Daniel 9. You need to say amen. Amen. Turn to Daniel 9. Verse 9. Now I thought he was 85 over here in 6. But in chapter 9, he's 70. Okay, how do I know that? Let's read it. He said, in the first year of Darius, the son of Hesar, of the seed of Medes, which was made king of the realm of Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, in the first year of the king's reign. Now, and the lion's then that was 15 years before, but he's saying here, he said, in the first year of his reign, I understood by book, the number of the years where of the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, he would have come to 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Look at verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. In other words, they was going to pray for his people when in the first year, when he was 70 years old, Daniel knew about prayer, he knew about fasting, he knew about laying before the Lord long before the lions then. Say long before the lions do. And so what Daniel understood was this. He said, I set my face to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. In other words, he was not a rookie. He was no stranger to prayer. Daniel knew what Samuel says in 2 chapter verse 30. Those who honor me, I will honor he, he knew about that. And so what happened was this. Daniel had been praying from the very get-go. Now I'm not going back to get the first chapter and get there, but Daniel had been praying from the get-go about the circumstances and situations that were going on in his life. And in the life of the people of Israel who were in captivity, say in captivity. In captivity. Okay. So Daniel didn't wake up praying in the lion's He already knew about prayer. He knew the power of prayer. But here's the thing that I need you to see. Turn to Daniel 10 and 2 and 3 again. We here see that Daniel was doing what? In verse 2. What was he doing? Morning. Morning. For how long? And in verse 3 he said he did what? Yo, I'm not finish what? No pleasant bread? What, what else? And I didn't bathe for three whole weeks. That's what I know. He didn't bathe for three whole weeks. Why? Because he was in prayer. He afflicted himself. Now, that's my, my third point is if you wait for the Lord, the lion's den, to pray until you late, my first point is this. He wants us to realize by his life that honoring God is the first priority. That's point one. Honoring God is the first priority. Why? Because Daniel had a heart for God and he taught by example how people are to live 
in a pagan society. Let's go back to chapter one. You can see in chapter one, man was roughly 16 years old. Say 16. You know the story. I don't have to go through the story. You know that Daniel decided he was not going to eat what the king rationed for them to eat. And what he did is he stepped out in faith, believing God would honor God's word through Daniel's obedience. So what does the king do? The king says, here, this is food for these people, and I need you to feed it to these people. And, and Daniel says, no, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat it. He said, matter of fact, just bring us some vegetables and water, and we're good to go. What Daniel did was not so much a fast, but a choice. What Daniel decided to do was to choose to obey God's dietary laws. In the minute that God laid up for them how they should eat, what they were supposed to eat, and what they weren't supposed to eat. So now they're in Babylon, and what the king says is give them this meat that's not kosher, it's not prepared right, it's been offered to gods, and give them wine and everything. And what Daniel says, no, Daniel was not choosing a diet, but Daniel said, I got a lifestyle. I'm going to live the way God would have me to live. And that stuff I can't touch, but I can eat the vegetables. I can drink the water. And I know that because God is in it and I'm being obedient. God is going to honor me and honor Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or whoever you want to call them, so that in 10 days, we'll be just as healthy as the folk who eat this other stuff. See, we want a diet. It's not about a diet. It's about a choice of a lifestyle. And Daniel's choice of a lifestyle was, I will be obedient to the word of God. Yeah. That's what he did. It wasn't about, because see, listen, we diet, we eat this diet and that diet and that diet and the other diet and this diet, because this diet says this and this one says that. And we try to figure out what diet you are. It's not about a diet, because the diet means we start and we end it sometime. And then we go to maintenance, which means when we go to maintenance, we start maintaining all that weight we lost back again. And so now we got to go to another diet, which goes another. No, it's about a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So what Daniel was saying, I am choosing to honor the lifestyle that Jehovah said that we're to live. And it's important that you understand that. His act was more of an act of obedience instead of a choice of a diet. See, our lifestyle, the way we eat, yeah, we got to choose because we eat wrong. We kill ourselves with sugar and flour and fried food and pig feet and chitlins and mug and whatever we need. We kill ourselves. And we love the way we do it. We become culinary experts at killing ourselves suicidally. And so then we need to purge. We need to detox because we're killing ourselves. And so we see it as a diet. No, what Daniel is saying, it's a lifestyle. That's what he was saying. It was a lifestyle. And he says, we're going to honor. See, that's what this is all about. It's not, he didn't choose a diet. He didn't choose to make things out of his diet. He said, I know what I can eat. I know what's good for my body. I know what God has sanctified. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's why God honored him. Because he was obedient to God's dietary laws. Now, I'm not here today to tell you what you need to do in terms of Honoring God with your diet. But Daniel knew that honoring God is first priority. In everything, first priority, honoring God. Your time belongs to God. Come on, that pastor. I don't care how young or how old you are, you're living on his time. Yeah. Every moment belongs to him. Every breath you breathe. Every step you take belong to God. You better get that clear in your thinking. God could take your breath. He could take your footstep 
now, but it belongs to him, and you are to honor him with his time. See, we have a church diet. Can't get too much church. It's two hours, it's too much time. Don't invite the preacher to come at the house and pray for us when we eat because he prayed too long. It's time to eat. There was a time when Sunday was the Lord's day. Amen. And now we, we're on a restricted diet. <laughs> we can't get too many spiritual calories. <laughs> Ask the neighbor if you want to restrict the diet. <laughs> It used to be a lifestyle. Listen, listen, can I tell you something? We used to go to church on Sunday, get there at 9 o'clock. Remember, we were there before 9 o'clock. My dad would die, we were there before 9 o'clock. We sat through Sunday school. Then we went to church. The church started at 11 o'clock in those days, and sometimes 2.30, you might be getting out. And guess what? As kids, we didn't mind. We'd be writing notes. <laughs> Fall asleep. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. Y'all know that. The we knew we had to go. We had nothing to do about us, so we learned how to cope and how to enjoy ourselves when we were there. Got older for some of us, and we we're still in church. But now, God forbid, stay this 12, Pastor. It's going a little too long now. She was having five minutes ago. What's up with you? I died, <laughs> but Daniel honored God. 16 years old, he says, I know only what I, who I believe, and I know that he's able to deliver us. And so, even at 16, what he was choosing was a lifestyle. Say a lifestyle. lifestyle. My second point, I'm, I'm finished, is Daniel wants us to know his purpose is to teach us that integrity gains favor. Integrity gains favor. Read this book, and one thing you'll find out is Daniel was honest and loyal to his masters, even though he never compromised his faith in God. Never. And what Daniel finds out, and what Daniel tells us, is rather than being an obstacle, that faith can be your motivation and your avenue to success. was being elevated to the second person in the nation. And the folks didn't like it, so they decided to conspire against him. And if you read carefully, you'll find out they couldn't find anything on him. So what they said is, maybe there's something in the law of God that we can get him on. And they saw him pray. And so what they did is they fooled the king. They said, okay, king, nobody should be praying to anybody or worshiping anybody but you. So at the sound of this, he said, we need you to blah, 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 pray and everything. Because they knew where Daniel prayed. And when they told Daniel, you know what Daniel did? Read it. Daniel went right to his crib, went right to the place where the window was, pointed to Jerusalem, after they told him what was happening. And he said, guess what? You ain't going to stop me. And he said, you know what he said? Father, I stretch my hand to you. No other help I knew. Thou would try. See, he prayed. He prayed in their faith. He was public about it because he knew he wasn't going to compromise who he was. And what happened? They snatched him. Because the king's word was the king's word. And they had to put him in the fire furnace. Now somebody said, uh -uh, that was shit back here. They put him in the lion's den. Now, do you think Darius going to put him in the lion's den? No. You sure? Turn to Daniel 6, 26, I'm sure you saw that. Look, we'll start verse 19. 6, 19. And already there, right? Verse 16, uh, verse uh, 19, right there. Then the king did what? 
Got up early in the morning and what did he do? He ran where? And when he came to the dying, what did he do? He cried with the middle voice in there and he said, What? Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God. What? What did he say? This is the king who put him in there. He runs. He says, Is the God you serve able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, Oh, king, what? Live forever. My God has sent his angels, his messengers, and have shut the mouth of the lion. They have not hurt me, forsaken me, from my innocence. He was found in me. He said, Oh, king. Then look at verse 23. Then the king was what? And said, What? Get him up out of there. You see that? So Daniel was taken up, no hurt was found on him because he believed in who? Then look at verse 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel. And what did they all do? They threw them into the den of lions. Who else with them? Their children, their wives, and the lions had happy men. <laughs> then look at 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all the peoples, nations, and language that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before God of Daniel, for he's a living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. That's the king. Do you understand what just took place there? A pagan king now recognizes the greatness and the strength of Daniel's God. Why? Because Daniel did not cower. Daniel did not compromise. Daniel did not back up. So now even his enemies are saying good things about him. Come on, You don't have to compromise. You don't have to play favors. You don't have to deny your God. Your God will be the purpose of why you get the promotion and not the Passover. In closing, Daniel's strength was in his devotion to prayer, not just in bad times, but on a daily basis. Daniel gives us a context for not only the word, but also theological understanding of history. Daniel's God, this God we serve, this God of Israel, participates in human life and history. Now, we're going to be in a Daniel fast, and I want you to understand that the Daniel fast that we're on is not about just denying yourself food because it's not really a diet, it's keeping ourselves from certain things and it's more about spiritual connection. Right. That's what it is. Not denying food. It is about spiritual connection which should be a lifestyle and it should be a lifestyle of obedience. Yes, you may admit certain food, but the deeper and true basis of this fast, as I said, is your spiritual connection. So as you fast, when you desire food or whatever area you're not indulging, during that time, turn the focus on God by reading your word and praying. In the book, you'll have a book, I'm going to give you a book on Sunday. It'll tell you the food you can and can't eat, that's okay. But this is not what it's all about. This is just a, a vehicle to get you to the end result. And what is the end result? Obedience to God, connecting to God, growing stronger and maturing in the things of God. That's what it's about. Daniel teaches us that the responsibility to God is to obey him first, to trust him, and to submit to his will and believe that whatever he ordains will be for your benefit and for his glory. God honors radical faith, risk-taking faith, radical faith. That scripture, Psalm 145, 18, says the Lord is dear to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. We're undertaking at Daniel fast. Whatever you choose to give up, whatever you try to choose to deny yourself, it is a time of moving from satiating the natural, physical, that we might be able to be satisfied in the spirit realm. That's what it's about, folks. It's about being obedient to God in whatever God calls you and asks you to do. That's why Daniel was able to go as a kid in a strange land and win respect 
when he was an older man, he was able to be elevated to the second position. When he was in the lines then, he was able to be able to have the God shut them out. Why? Because he chose a lifestyle of obedience. Amen. That's what we have to do. Learn to choose a lifestyle of obedience. I'm here today to tell you that no matter what the situation or circumstances, that if you call to God, he'll come and answer to those who call upon the truth. Your prayers are answered when you do something. Faith begins when you reach out. Healing starts when you take a step. God's help is near and available, but it's given only to those who seek another result from your apathy. God honors radical, risk-taking faith. When arcs are built, lives are saved. When soldiers march, Jericho's walls tumble. When staffs are raised, the sea opens. When lunch is shared, thousands are fed. When his garment and heart is touched, he stops and responds. Job said this in the 23rd chapter 12, boys, I have not departed from the commands of his lip. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. May you find strength in this message for your journey. Thank you. Find strength for your journey. Thank you. Point three, what? You wait. It's too late. Daniel's life proved that. He started way back at 16. And when he got to be 75, it was second nature. Second point? Or well, first point, rather. That's the second point? That's his life. That's what we're trying to do. Develop dynamic disciples. Who have integrity, dynamic disciples. Recognize that it's not about choosing a diet. It's about a lifestyle. And the lifestyle is obedience. Please come to your feet.